Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Today we continue our celebration of the exhibition Peacock in the Desert, the Royal Arts of Jodhpur, India, a remarkable exhibition that showcases more than 250 exquisitely detailed royal treasures from the Marmora Jodhpur region of India which is located in the far northwestern Indian state of Rajasthan. Now, most of the objects in the exhibition are from the collection of the Moranga Fort Museum, which is in Jodhpur. Many of them, I think all of you may know by now, leaving India for the very first time. So it's a real treat for us to have them as their first stop right here in Houston. In addition to the works from the Moranga Fort Museum, the royal family of Jodhpur has been exceedingly generous in loaning objects from their own private collections. Um, I just, I don't know how many of you know much about them. You see the, the images of the Moranga Fort and a lot of the video projections that are upstairs. The foundations of that fort were carved out of a rocky hillside 400 feet above Jodhpur, uh, starting in the year 1459 by the Rothor clan, which had just taken a control of the Marwar Jodhpur region because of course the first thing you need to do is to establish a military stronghold to protect your new interests. So uh, for many centuries then, uh, the uh, Moranga Fort was not only the seat of the Rothwar dynasty, but it served many functions as a military fortification, a royal residence, a center of cultural patronage, and a place of worship for members of the Rothwar household. Today, the fort, the fort houses the collections of the Moranga Museum Trust, which was established in 1972 by the current dynastic head of the Rothors, His Highness Maharaja Gosh Singh II. His Highness inherited his title in 1952 when he, he was just four years old. <laughs> um, and then of course he was taken out of the country for safety and to be educated. But by the time he returned to Jodhpur, Indira Gandhi had stripped all of the royal families of India of their titles and also of the privy purses that had been granted for disbanding their princely states following India's independence. Well, suddenly, what's he supposed to do? How's he supposed to make a living, you know? He, <laughs> so, and how's he gonna offset the cost of maintaining all of these palaces that, that had been built in the previous seven centuries? So, inspired by examples of royal European royals who had turned their stately homes into hotels and thrown open their magnificent gardens to ticketed tours, His Highness began the process of transforming Jodhpur's liabilities into cultural assets. And today, it is his only daughter, Princess Shrivanjali Raj of Marwar Jodhpur, who plays a very important role in the continuing transformation of her family's vast and diverse properties into hotels, museums, and other tourist attractions. And so for the first of our five lectures uh, related to Peacock in the Desert, we had the pleasure of hearing the two organizing curators of the exhibition talk with Princess Shrivanjali. And, uh, and then today is our second lecture of the five in this series. I want to say that our lectures are funded by the Brown Foundation, Inc. here in Houston. And I want to extend a very deeply appreciative thanks to the Brown Foundation for generously supporting these lectures, which we are presenting as the 42nd annual Ruth K. Shardle Lecture Series. Uh, Ruth K. Shardle was a longtime benefactor of our museum who died in 1975. The following year, her very good friend, Alice Pratt Brown, who served 26 years as a museum trustee, founded the Ruth K. Shardle Lectures, and the Brown Foundation has generously funded those lectures ever since. So we are delighted to be able to, um, to, to have as our focus for the 2017-2018 Shardle Lectures the exhibition Peacock in the Desert. This afternoon, our topic is the incredible world of Indian <coughs> jewelry, not just the beauty of their design, but the symbolism of their forms, their personal and societal statements, and the captivating stories that they encapsulate, stories of love, of passion, trade, and war. I'd like to invite Dr. Amy Poster, consulting curator of Asian art here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and a very longtime friend of our speaker this afternoon to please do the honors of introducing her. So, Amy. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everybody. This is one of the great honors that a curator has when they have been working in an institution, and in fact in many institutions over their career, and that is to bring together friends with mutual interests who have an opportunity to not only see this extraordinary exhibition in, uh, on view at the MFA Houston, but to hear the words and to see the researches of one of the world's greatest experts in the jewelry of India, Usha Balakrishnan, a, a specialist in this field who throughout her career has moved from the subject of Harappan, early, early Harappan culture for her doctorate at the uh, at Bombay University when she came to the United States to study at NYU in the field of museum studies. There was no student who had explored the area of, text, of, of jewelry at that time, and she was recommended to us by the very famous Alan Wardwell, the director of the Asia Society, to come and work at the Brooklyn Museum, where I was then curator and chair of the department, and we found a subject for her, Indian jewelry. The Brooklyn Museum housed at that time an extensive collection of uh, very, very significant Mughal objects on loan from Alistair B. Martin. You may have heard of the Gwenol collection. And in that short period of time of just over a year and a half, Usha focused on cataloging and producing works for us to study Indian jewelry in a new way. This was a new field for her, but she returned shortly thereafter to India for her marriage and took up the stronghold of studying Indian jewelry from that time on. She has had an opportunity to publish significant and important collections of Indian jewelry. The very first in 1999, Dance of the Peacock, which is still today considered the foremost reference in the field of Indian jewelry bringing together the documentary pieces and seeing them in greater context, something that you will see this afternoon in her presentation. More recently, she's had an opportunity to look to a famous collection in the United States that has recently been shown and is a promised gift to the University of uh, uh, Southern California. And also she did an exhibition in 2014 for the Kremlin looking together with the Indo-Russian approach and objects of great interest, particularly gemstones, diamonds from Golconda, and colored stones. With such a, a preponderance of jewelry in this exhibition, uh, my colleague Aimee Froome, the curator of Islamic art and my department believed that it was extremely important to open the discussion to look at these jewelry pieces that are not only from the Maharaja of Jodhpur and their collections at the Merangar Trust, but also to those holdings on loan to the MFA. And many of you have seen the Al-Sabah collection that are housed in our museum and have been on loan for close to three years. And it's important for us to see that some of those pieces are now on view in the exhibition. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Usha and will you all give her a round of applause? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for the introduction. Thank you uh, to the Museum of Fine Arts for inviting me uh, to share my knowledge uh, on Indian jewelry. Thank you, Amy, for that wonderful introduction. Amy has been my guide, my mentor, my teacher. As she herself mentioned, I was a student at NYU and my professor was Alan Wardwell. I interviewed with several museums to do my internship after I did my course, including Brooklyn. And I went back to Professor Wardwell. I said, you know, Professor, I'm really confused. Uh, where do I go? And he said, close your eyes and go to Brooklyn and you won't regret it. <laughs> and I haven't. Um, almost three decades later, Amy has been and remained a very, very dear friend. She introduced me to the wonderful world of museums. My journey and adventure into Indian jewelry started um, in Brooklyn. 
uh, when a dealer walked into our office one day with a suitcase full of Indian jewelry, which is now scattered in collections around the world, including uh, when I walked through the galleries here yesterday, some of the pieces looked very familiar in the glass collection. I think they came from the same, uh, from the same source. So yes, thank you, Amy. Thank you, all of you, for uh, having me here today. Um, I'd like to dedicate uh, this lecture today to the memory of Marthan Singh, um, who's on the slide in front of you. Who was so? For those of you who don't know him, Mar Marthan Singh was very closely associated with the conception and realization of the exhibition Peacock in the Desert. Uh, Mapuji, as we fondly called him, he was in fact in Jodhpur when he took seriously ill, an illness from which he never recovered. Mapuji and I shared a passion for gems and jewels, and over the last several years had many, many conversations on great Indian jewels. In fact, my forthcoming book, which will be out next month, titled Treasures of the Deccan, owes much to his support and encouragement. So, to the subject today. In 1880, Maharaja Jaswan Singh II of Jodhpur posed for a series of official portraits. The one on the left from the Mehrangad Museum, which is in the current exhibition, and the one on the right, which is in the Brooklyn Museum, New York, a gift of Robert and Amy Poster. Both portraits, look closely, feature the Maharaja in Indo-Western attire. A traditional Indian choga, or tunic, is teamed with Jodhpur trousers and leather riding boots. Prominently, he's wearing the mantle, star, and badge insignia of Knight Commander of the Order of the Star of India, which was awarded to him by Queen Victoria in 1875. But the most important feature of his attire in both portraits is the magnificent necklace that is draped around his neck and cascades down his chest. Comprising outstanding Colombian emeralds interspersed with Basra pearls, the jewel, in fact, is what completes Jaswan Singh's public persona in both the portraits. The necklace is ubiquitous in portrait after portrait of Jodhpur kings, also prominently visible in this portrait of Jaswan Singh's son, Sardar Singh. The portrait is also in the exhibition upstairs. The dynastic emerald necklace is a striking emblem of their Rathor lineage and the wealth and imperial might of the kingdom of Marwar. So the treasury to which these jewels belonged was the most important constituent of empire. Kautilya, the author of the fourth century BCE text called the Arthashastra, which was a treatise on statecraft and economics, states, and I quote, the king, the minister, the country, the fortified city, the treasury, the army and the ally are the most important elements of sovereignty. Writing specifically on the treasury, Kautilya further declares, and I quote, justly obtained either by inheritance or by self-acquisition, rich in gold and silver, filled with an abundance of big gems of various colors of gold coins, and capable to withstand calamities of long duration, that is the best treasury." End of quote. So wealth accumulated in the treasuries of the Maharajas in a variety of ways. Firstly, the ruler had to be offered the best gems that were mined in his kingdom, and those that were offered for sale in gem bazaars that lay in his territory. Nobles and vassals, regularly offered what was called nazar or nazrana, gifts of gold, gems, and jewels as expressions of their loyalty to the king, as seen in this detail from a painting in the exhibition. It features Maharaja Bhim Singh being offered a tray of jewels. 
Most importantly, vast quantities of gems and jewels flowed into the treasury of the Maharajas in the form of war booty. Now, by the whereabouts of the Jodhpur emeralds that we saw in the portraits previously are not known today, both Hanuman Singh on the left, the last reigning Maharaja of Jodhpur, and Maharaja Gaj Singh the second, the current Maharaja on the right, have been photographed wearing the fabulous necklace. Notice closely that even the turban ornament that they are wearing is the same. Now coming to the walls of the gods, wealth poured into the walls of temples in the form of gifts from kings, queens and deputies. Jewels were not mere decorative accoutrements for the deity. Each jewel was consecrated through rituals and the ceremonial dressing culminated in the processional carriage of the deities around the temple to present the magnificent spectacle that you can see in front of you to onlookers. So amid the rhythmic sound of drums and loud chants, nestled in the middle of a cornucopia of flowers and garlands, on the side in front of you, Lord Shiva emerges from the Sanctum San Santorum. He is attired in white jamas, a blue velvet jacket, and bedecked with fabulous jewels. Shiva, we say, is in full alamkara and assumes his earthly form. In this slide, he is on his way for his wedding with Goddess Parvati. He thus becomes visible to his devotees. The agamas, or rituals that are prescribed for worship of images in temples, stipulate alamkara or adornment with jewels as part of daily rituals. The ultimate reality, that is nirguna brahman, formless, without any attributes, transcendental, only realized through jnana or knowledge, they say becomes saguna brahman, that is, it assumes form, becomes visible and real. Thus, by draping images with clothes and adorning them with fabulous jewels, the gods assume an earthly persona. In this context, therefore, adornment or alamkara makes the invisible visible. The bronze processional idol or utsava murti, as they are known, of Shiva Natraja on the left is transformed into a human form on the right, dressed in beautiful clothes and adorned with jewels. And for people all around India, like the bride from Himachal on your left, jewels constituted savings. They were her stridhan, the wealth that she received at the time of her marriage from her father. Jewels were also social barometers of affluence, power and status. Distinctive ornaments indicated caste and ethnic identity, as seen in the jewels of the Konyak Naga tribesmen on the right. The hornbill feathers and wild boar teeth that are his headdress is a symbol of his status and rank in his community. Jewels were also worn to ward off the evil eye. They were worn as amulets for good health. They were important part of rite of passage rituals. Jewels adorned, they seduced. Most importantly, they maintained the human body in perfect equilibrium. The range and variety of ornaments in India is of cosmic proportions. Spanning a history of 5,000 years, spread across a geographical expanse of more than 3 million square kilometers, Adornment in India is actually a way of life. The population of India is 1.25 billion and every single person, newborn, young or old, rich or poor, urban or rural, owns a piece of jewelry. From birth to death, jewelry is akin to clothing, an inseparable part of the human body. So when we go through history, terracotta figurines, such as the one from Chandakethugar on the left side of the screen in Bengal, dating to the second century BCE, Yakshi figures from Bharut, the one in the center, Gupta figures, one on the right, 
and 11th century Chola bronzes at the bottom of the screen testify that while gods, goddesses, and even temporal figures might be devoid of clothing, they are almost never devoid of jewels. In fact, the renowned anthropologist Terence Turner states that, and I quote, the surface of the body as the common frontier of society, the social self, and the psychobiological individual becomes the symbolic stage upon which the drama of socialization is enacted, and bodily adornment becomes the language through which it is expressed." End of quote. From time immemorial, the gems and jewels of India have captured the imagination of travelers, gem merchants, conquerors, and connoisseurs. The adventurous, like Marco Polo on the left, came in the 13th century, drawn by stories of the wealth of the East, declaring that the region contains, and I quote, most of the pearls and gems that are to be found in the world, end of quote. Merchants like the French jeweler Jean-Baptiste Tavernier in the center of the screen made no less than six trips to Persia and India between 1630 and 1668, and he came to buy Golconda diamonds. Tavernia recorded in his diary, and I quote, the diamond is the most precious of all stones, and it is the article of trade to which I am most devoted, end of quote. And on the right side of the screen, invaders like Nadir Shah descended onto India in 1739. He claimed he came to plunder the Mughal treasury and carted away vast treasures, including the Kohinoor diamond, which you can see worn as an armband on the, in, the, in the portrait on the right of Maharaja Sher Singh, who was the son of Ranjit Singh of Punjab, as well as the peacock throne in this painting, you can see Shah Jahan seated on the legendary throne. Poetry and literature are eloquent with descriptions of jewels. The Devi Mahatmyam, the Chandi part, recites that aeons ago there was a war between the Devas and Asuras, the gods and the demigods. The Devas, that is the gods lost, and Mahishasura, lying at the bottom, became the lord of the heavens. The Devas then went and appealed to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, standing on the right, left side of the painting, to help them destroy the demon. Combining their energies, the gods brought forth Chandika, the great goddess, and gave her powerful weapons. But a perfect physical form div of, with, with weapons was considered not to be enough. So Vishwakarma, the architect of the universe, the supreme patron of the arts and crafts, gave her a celestial crest jewel, a necklace of pearls, earrings, bracelets, armlets, and bright anklets. So Chandika, thus adorned, empowered with jewels, she manifested herself in the earthly form to wage battle over evil. Inscriptions on temple walls record the receipt of magnificent gifts, and chronicles and diaries are filled with accounts of overflowing treasuries. Manuscripts, such as the ones on the screen in front of you, are crammed with paintings of bejeweled emperors, festooned maharajas, and ornamented maidens. And photographs, 19th and early 20th centuries, such as this one of Maharaja Umayyad Singh of Jodhpur, wearing a Victorian garden-style necklace and a turban ornament, which was made by Garards of London, captured bejeweled Maharajas, thus freezing a moment in time. So friends today, raiding the walls of gods, the treasuries of Maharajas and the storerooms of families, I have great pleasure in presenting you all today to my treasury of jewels, the incredible world of Indian jewelry. Every piece that I have chosen for my presentation today is an exemplar. It has been chosen as an illustration of history, of design, taste, culture, and artistic skill. Collectively, they are all milestones in a timeless legacy. Big or small, crafted from gold or silver, set with precious gems or just even glass, sumptuous confections of diamonds, 
or just simple beads and shells, these jewels are inscribed in the artistic and cultural landscape of India. There are jewels that were crafted in royal ateliers, while others were painstakingly made in some small workshop in a village somewhere in India. There are pieces that once lay in the treasuries of the Mughal emperors, while others lay tucked away between the folds of a sari in a humble home. Altogether, they represent an unbroken tradition of cultural continuity spanning more than 5,000 years. So we go back in time, 5,000 years. Very few items of really ancient jewelry survive in India. Gold and gemstones were recycled into new settings. They were used as cash to fund wars. Vast quantities was looted by waves of invaders. But it all began in the valley of Indus, in the cities of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. The chronicle of Indian adornment actually starts with a simple bead. India was the bead manufacturing center of the ancient world. Hundreds of thousands of beads in different shapes and sizes crafted from lapis lazuli, chalcedony, carnelian, agate, jasper, onyx, and so on were discovered in the excavations of the Indus civilization. The necklace, the bottom left, is made up of jade, gold, banded agate, and jasper beads. Look close and you will see that the famous bronze dancing girl on the right, discovered in the, uh, in the excavations of Mohenjo-daro, wears a necklace, practically identical one to the left side of the screen. The necklace on the right side is strung with flat, disc-shaped gold beads interspersed with turquoise, agate, and fins. The exquisite humped bull on top has been fashioned out of banded, banded agate fitted with gold horns. All three pieces date to between 2600 and 1900 BCE. They are exemplars of the technical knowledge of metallurgy, skill in fabrication, and sophistication that was in existence more than 4,000 years ago. Also from antiquity are these fabulous royal earrings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The pair dates to the first century BCE. The earrings are made from sheet gold, decorated with a winged lion, an elephant, and a vase containing three palmets. And you can see that, the three palmets. The figures are of repuse gold and decorated with minute granules and wire. The earrings are actually very large and heavy. Each one is three inches wide and one and a half inches broad. When worn, the earrings would have distended the earlobes and rested on the shoulder. They qualify not only because they are intrinsically beautiful and display the superb quality of goldsmithing in the period, but also because they provide evidence that jewelry depicted on sculptures was based on real examples. And if you look very closely, you can see that the Yakshi from Bharut is actually wearing a strikingly similar pair. My next selection of jewels comes from Sirka, Dakshila, the capital city of the Bactrian Greeks, located on the ancient Silk Road. These jewels, all of these jewels are in the National Museum in New Delhi, date to the first century of the Common Era, that is, which makes them more than 2,000 years old. They are classically Greco-Roman in design. They're made from sheet gold and decorated once again with minute microgranules, each one the size of a grain of sand. Delicate wire, repuse work and cloisons inlaid with color stones, turquoise paste and white feldspar are all hallmarks of craftsmanship. They truly articulate the legacy of Indian craftsmanship. Now diamonds, <coughs> were known in India 600 years before the common era. The Golconda mines supplied the world with the precious gem. So these, this earring 
which is a rare early piece that qualifies from the treasury of a king, is a 12th century Sultanate period gold ring set with three Golconda diamonds. The diamonds are all, if you look very closely, in their natural octahedral form, their exposed faces polished to outline the natural facets. This jewel, and there are many more like these that have been found in the course of excavations throughout Europe, it establishes that Indian lap the Indian lapidary was conversant with the art of diamond polishing 200 years before it was invented in Europe. The ring, the ring, this particular ring is also a milestone in the history of Indian jewelry. It is supposed, it's, it has an inscription and which establishes that it belonged to Muhammad Ghuri, the first Muslim conqueror of Delhi. References to jewelry in ancient Indian texts have inspired my next two choices. On the left is a signet ring. Now in the Ramayana, Rama's signet ring and Sita's Chudamani or head jewel serve as important elements in the plot. Sita, those of you who are familiar with the Ramayana, Sita had never met Hanuman before. So Hanuman carries Rama's <coughs> ring with him to Lanka to identify himself as Rama's messenger. While the ring on the screen uh, is inscribed Ram in raised Devanagari script, it is an allusion to Rama's ring. It was actually recovered from the slain body of Tipu Sultan after the siege of Seringapatam in 1799. Made of solid gold, this historically important ring weighs a solid 41 grams. On the right side of the screen is um, the Silapadikaram, a second century text from South India is considered to be one of the greatest Tamil epics. Once again, the story revolves around a jewel. This time, it is a shilamb or anklet of gold filled with rare gems, perhaps not unlike the one on the screen, which belonged to the Maharaja of Morvi. The jewel dates to the early 19th century. It's called a tazi or a toda. The intertwined gold links end in bud-shaped finials encrusted with diamonds and capuchon rubies. If you read the, the text that I have put in inverted commas, it's taken from the Ramayana and the Silapadikaram, which kind of alludes to the ring and the anklet. From a temple treasury in South India is this Padakam on the left side, a pendant which features Krishna flanked by his consorts. The figures are set with rubies and diamonds, carefully cut to conform to the form of the bodies of the figures. The facial features are carved in minute detail on the rubies. Such rubies, and you can see on the right, adorn processional images during temple festivals in South India. Also from a temple, and now in the Kalili collection in London, are these body coverings known as Kavacham, in the form of the hand of a goddess. And you can see a full gold body covering in the Indian gallery here in the museum. Um, the, the two hands here, palms date to the early 19th century. They are crafted from gold and studded with rubies, diamonds, and emeralds. And if you look closely, in the middle of the two palms is the Sanskrit letter Shri, meaning Lakshmi delineated with rubies and diamonds. Now, Shringara or adornment is among the 16 rituals of beautification prescribed for a bride in preparation for her wedding in India. It comprises a whole array of ornaments from the top of the head to the toes. Ornaments, it is believed, transform a bride from a temporal being into a divine goddess on the day of her wedding. So the marriage necklace is one of the most important rite of passage jewels for a woman. This magnificent necklace is from Chetinad in South India. And there is an equally magnificent example here in the museum, which I saw yesterday. The jewel is known as a Kalitir. It is the marriage necklace of the Natakote Chetiar, a trading community in South India. 
The massive necklace is made up of elaborate pendants crafted from sheet gold and exquisitely detailed with wire work and scrolling cutwork. The claw-like pendants, these claw-like pendants, are believed actually to derive from shell forms and the central pendant features a miniature icon of goddess Lakshmi seated on a lotus. The Chetias were originally a seafaring trading community that lived on the coast. It's believed that their early jewelry forms was, were shells, which as they gained affluence was transformed into gold. Read the verse alongside by an anonymous poet from the 18th century, which describes a beautiful bejeweled bride. Now, in the category of year jewels, my choice for my treasury was vast, but my selection was not difficult. These are palm, palm badam and tandati. They are jewels of stunning abstraction. They are the most, in fact, they are the most enigmatic jewels in the repertory of Indian jewelry. In both pieces, circles, triangles, and squares are juxtaposed in a brilliant grouping of forms. While the Tandati, which is uh, the, the jewel in the bottom, is pyramidal in structure, the palm badam on top has a minuscule image of a cobra, palmber, derived from the term Tamil word palmber. Its pointed tapering hood clearly visible. You can see the pointed tapering hood here, <coughs> over here. These earrings are worn only by women of the Vellalar Nadar caste an example on the right. While the origin and antiquities of the antiquity of these forms is not known, local beliefs attribute the design to be stylized versions of snake earrings worn by Lord Shiva when he danced the cosmic dance of creation. Nevertheless, whatever the story might be, they are timeless in their elegance and laden with infinite symbolism. Another set of earrings chosen for their beautiful craftsmanship is this historically important pair from the Al Sabah collection on exhibition in Peacock in the Desert. The earrings are completely encrusted with rubies. Each gemstone precisely cut, you can see each gemstone precisely cut to fit into the setting. The flowers in the middle are set with flat diamonds and cabochon emeralds and pearls edge the bell-shaped attachments below. The earrings, known as current fool jhumka, or dangling ear flowers, date to the 17th century. Look closely at the painting on the right. Similar earrings can be seen in the ears of the three princesses from Mysore. In this beautiful painting by Thomas Hickey, the painting dates to the early 18th century practically the same period to which the earrings belong and from the same region as well. Among neck jewels, my first choice is a beautiful Champakali necklace. The pendants, each one of these pendants in the form of stylized buds of the Michaelia Champaka flower. It is said the necklace is set with magnificent old cut and rose cut diamonds in front and decorated with lotus flowers painted in pink enamel on the back. While the provenance of this necklace is not known, it's in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, the necklace appears to be identical to the one worn by Maharaja Udaiji Rapuar of Dhar in the portrait on the right side. The ring below, which is in a private collection here in the United States, echoes the same design, also set with a magnificent old cut Golconda diamond with pink enamel on the reverse. Both jewels were most likely made in Benares, which was for several centuries the center for diamond cutting as well as for pink enamel. Jewels dispel anonymity in India. They proclaim caste, religion, and ethnic identity, and even unequivocally communicate an individual's region of origin. This is particularly the case among tribal and pastoral communities. Massive silver wadlo trocks, these are known as wadlo, 
are worn by Rabari women in Gujarat and Rajasthan. While the rigid talk hustly on the left side with the rectangular cuboid in the middle instantly identifies the wearer as a Muslim Fakira Nijat of the Thar Desert region in Rajasthan. Manufactured by humble craftsmen in the villages of the Thar Desert, the designs of both these jewels are strikingly modern and perfectly constructed. The Vardlo on the right again identifies, immediately identifies as, is identified as belonging to a woman of the Rabari community. Coming to the treasuries, this outstanding 19th century trock or hustle from a wealthy family is unusual and stunningly beautiful. Luminous green enamel on a white ground on the rivers, implying that it was most likely made in the Deccan, famous for green enameling. The flowers on the front on the left, set with diamonds and rubies. The jewel is known as a hustle or hansuli. The term itself is derived from the Hindi word which means the collarbone on which the jewel rests. Incidentally, the collarbone is also the location of thyroid gland and it is believed historically that such jewels were intended to keep the thyroid stimulated. Now the placement of jewels on different parts of the body in Indian culture was not just decorative but had physiological importance as well. According to a branch of ancient Indian science known as Marma Shastra, there are vital points along energy pathways in the, mod, in the body. Marma in Sanskrit means hidden or secret. So Marma points are hidden spots at the junction of veins, muscles, joints, bones, etc. And the placement of ornaments on these points gently stimulated the area and ensured that the body always remained physically and emotionally in perfect equilibrium. So armbands were worn around a vital energy point on the body. Hence amulets, tavis and powerful gemstones were always incorporated into armbands. Keeping with the amuletic function, of armbands, my selections are of jade and agate. Jade and agate had talismanic properties with the power to confer immortality on the wearer. The exquisitely carved nephrite jade flower on the right of the screen is from the Al Sabah collection in Kuwait. The jewel is designed as a marigold blossom with perfectly delineated overlapping petals. This kind of hybridization between hard jade and delicate beauty of a flower is the hallmark of Indian lapidary skills. The piece is from the Deccan and dates to the 16th or the early 17th century. The jewel on the top of the screen is also a jade armband from the 17th century, the heyday of the Mughal Empire. The white jade in this example is inlaid with gold exquisitely engraved with what is known as Parthaji Kam and the tiger figure in the middle is set with Kavushan rubies. In the ability to visualize, design and execute such unique pieces lies the exceptional genius of the Indian craftsmen through the ages. The Bazu Ban on top, this particular one, was converted into a brooch by Cartier in the early, early 20th century. And the example at the bottom, also from the Al Sabah collection, is from the 17th century. It's on exhibition here in the museum. Do <coughs> take a look at it. Set with fabulous banded agates and diamonds. Look closely and you will see, look at the line of the agate here that passes through the outer petals. The agate pieces are so precisely cut that you will notice that the white band appears as a perfectly connected line on the outer petals. Agates, like jade, were believed to have the power to ward off the evil eye and endowed with healing properties. Now Kautilya or Chanakya, who I've already referred to, was a teacher, philosopher and economist. He lived in the court of Chandragupta Maurya in the 4th century BCE. In his 
monumental compendium known as the Arthashastra, he actually states that the trade route across Dakshinapata or South India is the superior route, for it is rich in mines and abounds in, and I quote, diamonds, rubies, pearls, and gold. The Golconda diamond mines were in the Deccan, rubies and emeralds from Ava and Mogok in Burma, and Mudzo and Chivor in Colombia poured into the gem bazaars of the Deccan. The pearl fisheries were located off the Coromandel coast in the Deccan, and all the gold that flowed into India from time immemorial was for the purchase of luxury commodities like diamonds, textiles, and pepper, all products of the Deccan. Traders from Arabia, Persia, Russia, China, and all of Europe flocked to the Deccan. As a result, the syncretic culture that blossomed in the region was unlike any that existed in the north before the Mughals arrived. The Deccan was a hunting ground for gems, jewels and works of art even for the Mughals. Akbar, in fact, sent his emissary Asad Beg to the Deccan, instructed him, and I quote, collect whatever they may have of fine elephants and rare jewels throughout their dominions. You must not relax your efforts as long as there is one fine element or rare jewel out of your grasp in the Dakin. End of quote. So this jewel is a masterpiece of the Deccani idiom, a turban ornament. It dates to the early 17th century, set with large table cut diamonds. The center diamond over here is specially cut in a mango shape. The reverse is particularly stunning, enameled with red, golden yellow, and green hibiscus flowers on a pale blue and white ground. The spinel drop at the bottom is inscribed with the name of Jahangir. This piece probably once reposed in the Mughal treasury, perhaps a gift uh, to the emperor from a king of the Deccan. The piece is now in the Althani collection. Now, the debate on enameling um, in the context of the study of Indian jewelry continues among scholars. But I am of the firm belief that enameling entered India through the Portuguese enclave of Goa, again in the Deccan. The sophistication, finesse, and color palette of Deccani mina or enamel is exceptional. The most important and incredible milestones of this art form of enamelling, especially from this early period when it first came into India, are in the Al Sabah collection in Kuwait and seen in these two exceptionally beautiful pendants. The enamel motifs in both, you will notice, are simple and elegant, and the color palette is bold and striking. Now, in the Deccan, Hyderabad, again examples from the Deccan, Hyderabad emerged as an important center of enamelling. And these beautiful pendants, all three of them, come from the treasury of the Nizams of Hyderabad. Dinsha Ghazdar, the jeweler who in fact studied and catalogued the Nizams collection in 1950, wrote in his report, and I'm quoting, I have never set eyes on such jewels before. Each piece is beautiful, beautifully enameled on the back in colors obtainable only after pounding precious stones." End of quote. The three pendants, two of them, the two on the left are in a private collection, while the one on the right is in the Government of India collection, are beautiful works of art. Once again, the enamel surface is not crowded, and the emphasis is on delicate floral designs. The palette is vibrant with delicate touches of white. Monochrome, uh, black, white, and green enamel are typical of the Hyderabad Meena card. Another outstanding example of Deccani enameling here is this archer's thumb ring on the top left side, also from the Al Sabah collection on exhibition here in the museum. The ring itself is cast from silver, but enameled with vibrant blue and green foliage and a graceful parrot on both sides. The bazu band or the armband at the bottom 
is from the Nizam's treasury. Notice that the diamonds in front are set in gold and silver, again a hallmark of the Deccan, while the enamelling on the reverse with bold floral motifs is again of outstanding quality. While the bangle on the right, to provide a contrast, is not from the Deccan, but probably from North India, perhaps from Jaipur, set with diamonds on one side along the outer rim and very finely enameled on the inside. But you can see the contrast of the motives and the color palette between the two examples. This beautiful turban ornaments, Sarpati and Kal Kalgi, is from the Nizam of Hyderabad's collection. The jewels date to the early 18th century. Again, examples of outstanding Hyderabad enameling in contrasting black and white. They exemplify the beauty of the art form in the Deccan. Look closely at the photograph and you will see the young prince Salabadja actually wearing this jewel draped around his little cap. Now the Portuguese arrived in India in 1498 and in 1510 they seized the port of Goa and established the Estado da India, that is their empire in the Orient. Goa became the hub of the gem trade. Tavernier, the French German uh, French uh, merchant, gem merchant who undertook the voyages to India, recorded in his diary and I quote, Goa was the place where they did the greatest business of all, the greatest business in all Asia. For it was there that diamonds, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, topazes, and other stones were sold, and where there was the greatest trade in pearls. End of quote. So my next two selections are from Goa. This fabulous pendant dates to the 17th century, made in Goa. The jewel is set with diamonds and cabochon rubies in front, with an engraving of foliate vines around the stones. The minutely detailed engraving on the rivers, you can see this engraving, depicts lions, lionesses and gazelles amidst flowers and vines. Reminiscent of scenes of hunting scenes uh, depicted in miniature paintings and textiles and even carpets of the period. The workmanship is truly outstanding. Now while some believe uh, because uh, the, the piece has been attributed to Goa that the unusual shape is perhaps derived from a cuneiform, I found this pendant on this statue of Kartikeya, a sculpture of Kartikeya in the Bhopal Museum. The piece dates to the, the sculpture dates to the 4th century, very closely related in form to the pendant, revealing that perhaps the form was both indigenous and quite ancient and not necessarily derived from a cuneiform. Portuguese influence is also manifested in this gold tiara-like comb from Goa. The jewel is known as a Nantoni. The accessory dates to the early 19th century. It is fashioned from sheet gold and worked from repuse with an elaborate design that centers on a beautiful double-headed eagle. The bezels, now empty, would have originally been set perhaps with diamonds and emeralds. Bejeweled gomes form part of traditional Goan costume visible in this portrait. She's wearing a similar tiara uh, comb in gold. <laughs> From the Deccan, designs, techniques and skills traveled north into the Mughal court, where they coalesced with Mughal artistic sensibilities to produce the quintessential Mughal style jewelry which we all know as Kundan Meena or just simply Jadao, a unique combination of gold, gems and enamel. The technique of Kundan, using ribbons of pure gold to set stones without the application of any heat, is India's contribution to the legacy of world jewelry craftsmanship. Now to the Mughal emperors, gems and jewels were symbols of power and sovereignty. More importantly, they were symbols of legitimacy. Exceptional emeralds, spinels, and even diamonds were inscribed with the names and titles of the sovereigns to whom they had belonged. Such dynastic jewels and gemstones 
were handed down by an emperor to his son and gifted to another monarch. Several such gems have survived, now dispersed in collections around the world. My choice from what Thomas Rowe, the English ambassador to the court of Jahangir, described as the treasury of the world, are these two extraordinary jewels now in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. The archer's ring at the bottom is crafted from gold and set with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. On the inside of this ring, within this cartouche done in Partaji Kam and inlaid with minutely cut rubies, all that you see in red are all rubies, is Shah Jahan's name. No other comparable example is known, making this jewel truly exceptional. The bangles on top encapsulate the essence of Mughal aesthetics, combining great design, beautiful gems, fine enameling, and exquisite workmanship. There is incredible precision in their manufacture. The surface of the bangles, for example, is entirely covered with precious stones. There are three old cut diamonds and 547 large and small rubies, each one individually cut, each ruby is individually cut in the shape of flower petals. The inner side over here is enameled uh, with narcissus flowers on a translucent green enamel ground. Both jewels are posed in the Mughal treasury in Delhi, looted by Nadir Shah in 1739. Another Mughal masterpiece from the Deccan is this pendant with a cameo portrait of Emperor Shah Jahan. The piece is here in the museum. Do take a close look at it. The cameo front, it is believed, dates from the 17th century. It features a white sardonyx cameo portrait of Shah Jahan with a border of flat channel set rubies and gold and the reverse reminiscent of the Bidri work famous in the Deccan is silver inlaid with niello, an alloy of copper and lead mixed with sulphur, floral designs of carnation flowers. The details in the cameo carving, if you look at all the jewelry that Shah Jahan is depicted with, and if you look at the scale of the pendant uh, upstairs in the gallery, and you realize the, 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 the degree of detailing that the artist was capable of executing. Now, Indian myths state that gemstones came forth from the dismembered body of the demon Bala, who offered himself as a sacrifice to Indra, the god of gods. His teeth it is believed were transformed into pearls, his bones into diamonds, his eyes into sapphires, his blood into rubies, and his bile into emeralds. So these five gems are the Maharatnas or the great gems of Indian jewelry. The Ratna Pariksha, an ancient Sanskrit text on the science of gems states, and I quote, if there is a diamond anywhere in this world which is completely transparent, light, with a beautiful color, with absolutely even surfaces, with no scratches, no scars, no damage, no scrawls, no sign of cracks, even if it is only the size of an atom, then it is indeed a gift from God, the kind of importance that was given to diamonds. In Sanskrit, the diamond is referred to as Vajra, or thunderbolt, or Indra Yudha, the weapon of Indra. References in ancient texts irrefutably established that Indians knew how to cut, polish, and value diamonds. Diamonds were classified as early as the fourth century BC um, into four castes. Every effort was made to preserve maximum mass and weight, and rough stones, no sliver, however small, was discarded. Historic diamonds of Indian origin are scattered in collections around the world. Everybody knows about the Kohinoor, the Blue Hope in the Smithsonian, the Orlov in the Russian Diamond Fund, and so on. Recently, however, I was privileged to study and document this beautiful historical Golconda diamond, which emerged after lying hidden for more than a hundred years. The term Golconda itself conjures up a significant image in the minds of jewelry aficionados around the world of a gemstone of unparalleled beauty. 
liquid limpidity, transparent luminosity, and extraordinary clarity. This particular gemstone is known as the Nizam diamond. It weighs 120.80 carats. Internally flawless, it's a type 2A diamond. The gem was discovered in the historic Golconda mines in Kolur. The original rough is believed to have weighed 450 carats. The gem reposed at one time the treasury of the Nizams of Hyderabad, today in a private collection. Fabulous diamonds came together, come together in two, uh, in this beautiful uh, belt, again from the Nizam of Hyderabad's treasury. The front is set with old cut diamonds in an open work design, but the sheet gold on the back side is finely etched with floral motifs. And you can see the young boy, six Nizam, is actually wearing this belt around his waist. Also from the Asif Jha coat is the stunningly beautiful pair of anklets set with parallel rows of Golconda diamonds. Countless such pairs were made for the favorite wives of the Nizam. This is a rare example that has survived. Look close and you can see the beautiful lady from the Nizam Zanana here. She appears to be wearing a strikingly similar pair. Next among the Maharatna or the great gems are rubies. In Thakura Feru's Rayana Parika, again, a text on gemology. Um, rubies were classified according to their color. Padmaraga was red like the lotus. Purplish ones were known as Jamunya, and gems with a hint of black or blue were known as Nilagandhi. Known as Manika or Manikam in India, the red gem is ubiquitous in traditional South Indian jewelry because they were brought to the gem markets of South India by Chetia traders from the mines in Burma. These two necklaces are classic jewels of the South, known as a Vaijanti Mada or Makara Kanti. The name derives from Makara or crocodile, uh, the stylized form of a crocodile. Both jewels are set with beautiful collection of Burmese rubies. These bracelets from the Al Sabah collection, also on exhibition here, set with beautiful pigeon blood red rubies again from Burma. Rubies were a symbol of the sun and were rarely faceted. They were set en cabochon in jewels of the period. The, the um, bird pendant also here in the museum on the right, also from the Al Sabah collection, set with fabulous rubies. And if you look closely in this portrait, you can see this king from Rajasthan actually wearing a very, very similar pendant. Emeralds poured into India from the 16th century after the arrival of the Portuguese and the discovery of emerald mines in Colombia and South America. Now the Mughal emperors were passionately fond of the green gem. Green was the color of paradise and em emeralds were a symbol of eternal life. So from the Al Sabah collection are these two beautiful beads. The emeralds are carved with floral motifs and inscribed with verses. They were often inscribed with verses from the Quran in the belief that the inherent prophylactic properties of the stone could be enhanced. Now the carving on the gems in front of you testify to the extraordinary genius of the gem cutter. The amazing brooch on the left was made by Cartier in 1937 for Maharani Gayatri Devi of Jaipur. It is a hexagonal emerald originally from the Jaipur treasury. Now this particular stone is particularly is fascinating. It offers an amazing insight to in, into India and the gem trade in the 17th century. The gem is carved in amazing detail. It depicts a female figure, if you look closely, a female figure seated on a pedestal throne offering a bunch of grapes to a male child seated on her lap. Below the throne are an antelope and a cow. Now variously interpreted as images of Shiva and Parvati or Radha and Krishna, I think the inspiration for this tableau perhaps lies in paintings of the Madonna and Child of the Grapes, such as the 17th century work by Pierre Mignard on the right. While the theme is European, the stylistic characteristics of the images is 
typically Indian. The gem was most likely carved in Goa. Royal portraits presented by the East India Company to the Mughal court captivated the emperor and they often presented books, etchings and paintings to the emperor and perhaps something like this came into the Mughal court from Europe at that time. You will notice that the child on the woman's lap in the emerald bears a close resemblance to the exquisite carved emerald figure on the right bottom from the Althani collection, also undoubtedly carved in Goa, or its visibility, judging by the Maharashtrian style cap on the figure, it is uh, inlaid with a ruby on top, perhaps used as a pendant at some point. Now, Varaha Mihira, the author of the Brihatta Samhita, a 6th century gemology text, prized pearls above all gems. In verses extolling their beauty, he describes a pearl necklace as consisting of 1,008 strings. It was used as an ornament for the gods, and he calls it Indu Chanda, or moon's pleasure. Pearls were born perfect. They were symbols of purity. The Baroque pearl pendant on the screen in front of you is a jewel of great beauty. It makes its way into my treasury from the Althani collection. The jewel dates to the late 16th century. It is crafted in the form of a composite figure, the upper body of a human and the lower body with two, you can see the long intertwining tails of gold set with rubies, diamonds, emeralds and blue glass. While there is a debate on the identity of the figure, it appears to be a Nagadevta, a snake god. Again, the jewel was most likely manufactured in Goa. Jewels enhanced fertility. They protected against the influence of powerful planets and served as talismans against the evil eye. Indian texts say that um, gems were created from the body of the demon. And the planetary bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the different planets usurp these gems for themselves. Thus, when the nine gems, Navaratna, are combined and arranged in accordance with the cosmos, with the sun in the middle, they become cogent entities. This striking amulet pendant qualifies, it comes from the treasury of Tipu Sultan, the tiger of Mysore, set with the nine planetary gemstones. You can see them arranged around. Tipu was a Sunni Muslim. While traditionally the Navratna would always have a ruby because the sun was the center of the planetary system, in accordance with convention of him being a Muslim, in this example, emerald, a symbol of paradise, is set in the center of the pendant. Now, as the Mughal Empire declined and eventually collapsed, native states rose to prominence power and wealth throughout India. As you can see in the exhibition upstairs, one of the native states and one of the very powerful native states of India was the kingdom of Marwar, Jodhpur. It was a period, so the 19th century was a period of magnificent splendor and ostentatious display. To the Maharajas of India, adornment was not just a matter of tradition or personal taste. It was also a proclamation of lineage, rank, wealth and power. And the one single jewel that proclaimed the Maharaja's sovereignty was the turban jewel. No treasury could be without turban jewels. The king was empowered by his crown, by the ornament that he wore on his head. The jewel was both metaphysical and magical. In this blazing turban jewels, as you can see in the two photographs in front of you, Nawab Sadiq Khan of Bahawalpur on the right and the young Chamarajendra Wadiyar of Mysore perhaps took it to an extreme, judging by their massive turban jewels. But throughout India, turban ornaments were de rigueur, and they come in fabulous sizes, shapes, and designs. So one outstanding example of a turban jewel is this magnificent sarpej, or turban ornament, which is on exhibition upstairs. Please don't miss seeing it dates to the early 18th century. It's crafted from gold and set with diamonds and exquisitely enameled on the back. The jewel once belonged to the Nizam of Hyderabad and you will see that the color palette again corresponds 
to the fabulous Minakari work of the Deccan that we saw on some of the previous slides. This exquisite spinel and ruby serpage are also from the Nizam's treasury. They were both manufactured in the late 19th century. The one on the top is set with an outstanding collection of Burmese pigeon blood rubies, diamonds, and briolet diamonds along the edge. The emerald serpage at the bottom is composed of an octagonal carved emerald and pear-shaped carved emeralds on either side, highlighted with two light pink, pink diamonds on top. Both jewels manifest European design influences that were sweeping through India in this period. The recent discovery of a photograph, which will be in my forthcoming book, Treasures of the Deccan, of the two princes, Azam Jha and Muazam Jha, sons of Mir Osman Ali Khan, the last Nizam, and you can see them both wearing these very same jewels. Here's Azam Jha wearing the ruby sarpej and Muazam Jha wearing the emerald one. Another example of uh, turban ornaments, the one on the left is from the Khalili collection, is from Mysore in South India, set with rubies and diamonds. The sarpej on the right is set with emeralds, diamonds, and pearls, and again, beautifully enameled. In fact, the one on the right is now in the British Royal Collection. It was a gift to Albert Edward, the Prince of Wales, by the Maharaja of Udaipur during his visit to India in 1875. And this unusual example, Maharaja Raghubir Singh of Mundi, it appears, literally beamed his faith from his turban. The aigret here, over here is in the form of a hand raised in blessing set with white sapphires. The saffron colored enamel palette on the refers is atypical and extraordinary and you can see the symbols. These are the 32 symbols that is associated with Raja Yoga and then I discovered this fabulous photograph of the Maharaja actually wearing this sarp page. Now for women um, ornaments were also objects of seduction and allurement and in the Kama Sutra, Vatsyayana actually mandates that women should have a knowledge of gemstones and how to string necklaces, design beautiful jewels and even make ear ornaments. So in this beautiful painting of Radha and Krishna from the Punjab hills, we notice that Radha here is draped only in a sheer dupatta, but is adorned with all her jewels. And please do read the, uh, the verse from Jayadeva's Gita Govinda on the right, because it kind of expresses in the most beautiful manner the language of ornaments. So the women of India were no less adorned than the men. This is a photograph from the Nizam of Hyderabad's uh, Zanana where this chinta, the, sorry, the collar necklace was de rigueur over there and they were made I, perhaps in the hundreds. This beautiful example is in the exhibition upstairs and if you look closely, every one of these six wives of the sixth Nizam is wearing a chinta. These chintaks are now scattered in collections around the world. Now, Next choice is not, my next choice is prompted not only by the beauty of the jewel but also because of the romantic story that is associated with it. This is Anita Delgado, a Spanish flamenco dancer who fell in love with Jagajit Singh of Kapoorthala. And this beautiful, and please, I, I think we are running out of time, so do take a moment to read the core, the little piece from her diary that I have put on top. The um, beautiful crescent-shaped uh, emerald was apparently originally an elephant ornament. <laughs> Anita Delgado fell in love with it and she wore it not only around her forehead here, but often as a brooch or as a pendant. Now, jewels for animals were no less beautiful and magnificent and uh, beautiful jewelry were made for elephants and horses and you can see it in some of the paintings upstairs where the animals are caprisoned in such a beautiful manner, including the majestic examples that you see as you enter the exhibition and these pieces that have survived, uh, which are on exhibition upstairs. 
Now, coming down to my last few slides, in the 19th century, jewels also functioned as a means of expressing allegiance to the British Empire. These unusual bazubans are from Murshidabad. They depict the main elements of the pre-November 1880 coat of arms of the Nawab Nazim. This is his coat of arms of Murshidabad, Bengal, typical of the European influences in Indian jewels of this period. The love affair between Europe and India climaxed in the early 20th century, manifests itself in ornament types, which great jewelry houses like Cartier, Van Cleef & Arthur, Chaume, Maubazin, all turned to India for inspiration. They created a new genre of jewels that married Indian color motifs with European elegance and techniques. As you can see in the necklace on the right, which is derived from the traditional South Indian manga mala, and this beautiful brooch on the right, made by Van Cleef and Apples, which is modeled on a South Indian monkey. And finally, in keeping with the title of the exhibition, Peacock in the Desert, and the, Itali and the Eternal Romance of Jewels, I end with this beautiful peacock aigret by Melerio de Meet, uh, Dietz, uh, Meler of Paris, dating to 1905. The body of the bird is decorated with blue and green enamel. The articulated tail feathers are set with 1,742 rose-cut diamonds. Although the jewel is not made in India, it is now part of the legendary romance of Indian jewels. The jewel was purchased by Maharaja Jagatjit Singh, Maharaja of Kapurthala, who pinned it to his turban when he attended the wedding of Alfonso XIII of Spain. It was love at first sight for the Spanish flamenco dancer Anita Delgado. <laughs> they married soon thereafter. <laughs> Jagatjit Singh presented the peacock brooch to her, promising her, and I quote, you will always be my little bird of the isles. Sadly, the marriage did not last long. <laughs> But Anita loved the jewel and often wore it as a corset brooch, as a sari pin, and as an aigret in her hair, as you can see in this photograph. The peacock is a symbol of India. It's the bird of India. But above all, it's a symbol of joy, beauty, uh, beauty harmony, and pride. I think everything that Indian jewels stand for. Thank you.